uh, Solara and how Solara can simplify building uh, complex dashboards in, uh, in Python. And as you see, I put an asterisk at uh, dashboards because Solara is more like a general web uh, framework. So you can build uh, a web app in it. But most people, they start looking for like a dashboard solution only to find out later that they want to build something like larger or sometimes described as a, uh, a data app. But um, dashboard is kind of the common word people use. Um, okay, so let's introduce myself a bit. I started life as a uh, software engineer, um, but then I, uh, out of curiosity, went into uh, astrophysics, did a PhD and postdoc there. And this is kind of how Dali uh, uh, sees me. Um, so during my postdoc, I created uh, two projects, uh, one FEX and out of court data frame. And my other work was on a IPy widget library, IPy volume. Um, so these projects led me to become a uh, freelancer in 2018, and uh, especially the work on um, IPy widget um, and becoming an IPy widget maintainer um, led to me becoming a distinguished contributor in, for Jupyter, and also my work on Voila uh, added there. Um, so I worked with passion also on, on FEX, but uh, really the clients that we had, they drove me towards the, the dashboarding uh, direction. Uh, there was a uh, overwhelming need for, uh, for that uh, and the need to uh, improve that. And that led to the company we have now, uh, Vigetti, uh, co-founded with uh, Mario and uh, Eric Rowe. So in this talk, I wanna describe shortly why we built uh, pure di uh, Python dashboards or web apps. Um, <clears throat> I'll describe a bit of the problems that we uh, we uh, we saw and solved. Um, I'll describe the solution to that. Um, I always want to give a bit of a feeling how it works. So I'm going to do a live demo in between, and I think after that, it's uh, I can better describe what Solara is. And I want to give a few concrete examples of apps built uh, using. Uh, using Solara. So why do we actually build pure Python web dashboard? So web, uh, I don't think I need to explain. Everything's web-based now. Um, but why do we do it in, in Python? And, and it's kind of, uh, it's really expensive to do separate like front-end and uh, back-end uh, development. Uh, and actually the domain expert, for instance, a data scientist or a quant, um, usually knows Python, and they're actually the best to translate this into um, into a, uh, a dashboard. Um, and also, it's very easy to access all the Python libraries that we uh, that we use uh, directly from Python instead of via an API, a REST API. Um, so that makes for faster development and um, uh, faster refactoring of your application instead of having to redesign your whole REST API. Um, also very important is uh, team interchangeability. If someone gets sick and it's your front-end person, uh, the project can still uh, uh, continue if, uh, if everybody uh, just needs to know Python. Uh, in summary, it's easier, faster, and cheaper to, uh, to make pure Python web dashboards or apps. Um, so what kind of problems did we actually see? So on the a horizontal axis, we have the, X, um, the axis describing kind of your dashboard size. And we start often in the, like uh, on the left, a small app or small dashboard describing something simple. Um, but they usually grow and the dashboard grows in size and it describes something complex. So there's some essential complexity in it. And that's fine. You're trying to uh, like automate or solve a complex uh, problem or give insights into like a complex uh, workflow. But on the y-axis, we have problems or more formally incidental or accidental complexity. That could be like your framework not really working in the way you want. And what we saw is with a lot of frameworks that uh, once your app grows a little bit, that you, uh, that you have a lot of these problems and you start feeling like this grumpy cat, uh, not exactly happy. And be basically dealing with problems you, uh, you rather not deal with. So what we wanted is a, a solution that allows you to go further, like create a larger application uh, without uh, accumulating all these uh, incidental or accidental complexity. 
and hopefully make you feel a bit more happier like this cat. And we believe we've uh, solved that uh, using Solara and that's what I want to talk to you today about. So what are the problems we observe? So I'll explicitly mention Voila and IPy widgets because that's what I uh, developed on, but maybe you also recognize it in the in a different framework that you use. So I talked about this complexity, incidental complexity, and there are a few things why this happens. Um, it could be that your state is spread in a UI, for instance, that a user is logged in, is in a checkbox UI component, uh, or it's in multiple components, so it's spread around. An imperative API, so you manually need to remove or add UI elements. Um, and also event handlers, you have to remember like to detach an event handler, otherwise you still trigger some code. Um, and together, you really need to keep the UI elements in sync with the uh, kind of the state of your application, what it's describing, like the filtering, if you're logged in, etc. And all of this is basically, um, is that makes it really hard to make your UI uh, consistent with your, uh, your state. Another thing we noticed a lot, which is a, a hard problem, is uh, how do you, in UIs, make it possible to reuse code? Uh, another thing I won't talk say much about that a little bit is, uh, but if you're stuck in the framework you have, uh, maybe your components are too limited of your framework, how do you get out of this? And all of this, this makes you feel like this cat and we want to solve that. Um, on top of that, um, um, not being developer friendly, uh, what do we notice with IPy widget, the development cycle is kind of slow, restart your kernel, refresh your browser. That's not really something you want to be doing while developing. You want it, this cycle to be fast. Um, another thing we want, uh, modern Python should, uh, should have uh, type checks. So that is uh, something uh, uh, we really want to have uh, and have a test framework. So how do we solve the complexity? So what we actually done is, is take a look at the JavaScript uh, world because they've, they've done, uh, they've gone through all of these problems that, and they're, they've built many, many UIs. So we've taken some inspiration from React and uh, this particular signal for um, uh, library from pre -react, uh, React variant. But the main point is we think a UI framework should be declarative, reactive, have some encapsulation or components and a story for state management. Hopefully this will make you feel like this cat. So let's talk about reactive. You've probably used an Excel spreadsheet, uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet or any other spreadsheet like uh, um, like in Google, you have two cells with um, and length and areas multiplication of these two. You change an element and everything updates. You don't have to manually go through your spreadsheet to say this uh, this cell needs to be updated. And how does that translate into to Python? Um, let's imagine you have a component that shows the first twenty rows of your data frame. Um, now imagine you can change it with a slide and you want to reset it. So we have an event handler that changes this max row value, but you cannot really observe that this value is changing. Unless you're James Powell, um, this is really not a, a, a feature that, uh, that uh, Python, uh, Python has. Instead, you can uh, use a very Pythonic solution is to have a container around a value. Uh, in this case, we have uh, a reactive uh, variable max rows that you then um, write to using the property value and access using the property value. And with this, we can implement um, that our components are reactive. Declarative. So what is declarative? Tell what you want, not how to do it. For instance, we have an old kitchen, old situation. I want the kitchen to look like this. I say a builder like, make it look like this. I don't describe like uh, first put in the lights, then do the floor, then um, I'm not interested in that. I want this solution. So how do you do that in a UI? So in a UI, you want um, um, basically UI to be a function of the data. So I already showed you these reactive variables. So let's imagine we have a list of messages. We can 
add a message. So we modify the reactive variable or reset it. Now we want to react to that. So if we don't have messages, we want to show something special. And otherwise, we want to iterate over the messages and show, uh, show the message. So what's hap happening here? Maybe this is already very intuitive to you. But uh, what's actually happening is all the UI transitions in this particular example happen automatically. So you don't manually create uh, the, uh, the widget underneath it. You don't have to manually update it. You don't have to insert it. So if I add a message, it automatically inserts on the screen what's necessary. Um, and you don't have to uh, delete it. So if I check, reset and I reset the messages, it will remove all of the infos and replace it with the warning. So that, um, so that you don't have to do as much work manually. Let's talk about um, uh, reusability and encapsulation. Let's imagine we have this a relatively simple code where we calculate the unique values, create a figure, add a bar plot, optionally set a title, and we show it. And this could be code that you're using a lot in your, uh, in your new dashboard. Um, so you saw in the previous slides, okay, I apparently have to add this like a component decorator, function name, um, and give it arguments. Great. So now I can reu uh, reuse this bar chart component in my application. But uh, two things, like why, how is this like different from a function? And why this capitalization? Why is this not a, a snake case? So here I put another element in it or making use of another component that depends on something else. Now, if this component re-executes, Solara will actually recognize that all the arguments are the same for bar chart. So it will not re-execute this function. It will actually see, okay, these are the same, so I'll reuse the previous one. Um, and uh, people love this a lot because for instance, a comparison is uh, streamlit, which basically re-executes your whole script. Well, here we only re-execute the components where uh, arguments have changed or internal state has changed. Okay, so we now evolve our app, give it an extra argument, so we can determine what the color of the bar chart is. Um, but now imagine that we change the color. Now we re-execute this function while only the color is changing. And now I get back to why this is um, a case like this, as if it is a class uh, instead of a function. And the reason is if we re-execute a component, there's actually some memory of the previous execution. There's a lifetime associated to this function, kind of an implicit self, if you were talking about uh, an object. And in this case, I'll demonstrate it using the uh, use memo hook, which can hook into the life cycle of a component. And that is saying the, this function should only be re-executed when the data frame or column is being changed. And now it will only um, execute this function once if the data frame and column don't change. Um, so this shows you like the, the, the power of components. So let, let's go a little bit further. You say, well, this is actually too slow. It's taking like uh, two seconds for my value counts. So what, what next? Um, this will block the UI, it's not really user friendly. And this, uh, for this, we have this use thread hook. So that's basically uh, another hook. And you see that the code change is really small and this allows us to, to execute something in a thread, um, show the progress uh, in a progress bar and have the whole UI uh, responsive. And, and this basically is what's usually uh, pretty complex working with threads is really encapsulated in this component. So a pretty complex solution is like fully encapsulated in this component and, and reused many times throughout the, uh, your dashboards. Um, so let's uh, uh, hope my lucky slide works again. So I want to give you a little bit of a demo 
of how this works in, pro, uh, in practice. Okay. So we start the Solara server. Let's refresh it. Okay, it says no object with the name page. So what Solara wants is a component with the name page. Let's display my data from. Okay. What I want to do is I want to take a look at this uh, category. Let's see if we can make uh, some bar charts. Here. Uh, I don't like the uh, casing here. So I help of Copilot turn this into a title casing. And you see, I save it and it automatically refreshes. So if I save it, the whole script gets executed. Um, and now um, we want to filter by categories. So categories. And we're going to filter data frame. Thank you, Copilot. I filtered it to warrants only. So now we want to have a um, uh, Take this one, Copilot helps us again. So we will have, have a nice label, the categories here. And you see that it takes this argument. So there's bi-directional communication. If, it, if the select changes, it updates the value. And you can see that automatically re-render. So very easy to, to set up. In the example, I showed you this uh, bar chart. What we can do is already put this in a module. So we can have this bar chart with actually the threading. Now you see that we have a nice visualization. So you see it actually took a long time. I put a sleep statement in there. Um, I prepared some other. Um, now we can sh like show a map. Maybe we want to reorganize the app a bit, a bit. put this in a sidebar. It's in two columns and not show the data from. Okay. And now we have a app that can handle large data sets, can render uh, maps, etc. So now you say, okay, my colleague is actually uh, using a Jupyter Notebook. Well, that's great because it's built on top of iPad widgets. So I can, in a classic notebook, Jupyter Lab, I can all render this. Uh, also on Colab, this works. So I can render it in line in the sidebar shown here. I can make it render full screen. And what's nice is that I can now take a look at the reactive variables and say, well, actually, if I change it here, so I can read it off in the notebook, but also the other way around. So if I'm doing things in code, actually trigger re render from here. So you can have these like small mini apps that respond to changes in the data. Okay, let's go back to the talk. Okay, great, this worked. So what is Solar? We've seen a little bit of it. So we have um, two parts. So we have the Solara UI. You've seen most of that. It's a pure Python web framework to create apps or dashboards. It has a React-like like API, so it's inspired on, on React, but also have reactive elements. Um, and together with the declarative way of writing your app, uh, this reduces complexity a lot. You don't have to think about like manually updating. Um, and you can create these composable, reusable UI components. Having quite complex behavior, as I've shown, you can hook into the lifecycle, uh, work with threads. Um, but we also, because we're really data oriented, have a lot of components, so buttons, sliders, uh, but also for visualizing data frames um, 
and as I said, we reuse the IPy widget ecosystem. So there are a lot of th uh, third-party IPy widget libraries that you can uh, already integrate in your uh, Solara app. But also solving common data challenges, uh, threading, as I demonstrated, cross-filtering, caching, etc. Um, and we have a story for uh, type safe uh, state management. So our reactive variables, everything's typed uh, that allows you to iterate much faster without uh, introducing small, small bugs. And I didn't mention much about this, but we also have this Solara server. I'll go a bit into detail later. Let's describe a little bit how uh, Solara is built. So on the UI part that you see here on top, that is built on top of a, um, a React-like uh, API called Reacton, which sits on top of IPy widget. So Solara is using Reacton and IPy widget. Um, and the nice components that you saw are coming from this uh, third-party library, IPy Futify, which is the material design. But you can also use these other IPy widget libraries. Um, as I've shown, it runs in the Jupyter Notebook, also runs on Lab or Voila, so basically on the whole Jupyter stack or Google Colab. But we also have this Solara server, and it's using Starlet or Fast API. It can use Flask uh, use, uh, as a web server, uh, still using the same Jupyter protocols, um, but this is something we recommend for, for production. It has a, um, an in-process virtual kernel it's much much more efficient for uh, for handling many uh, many users and sharing sharing memory. Um, so just to give you an example, some examples of, of um, um, to get an idea how you can use Solara. So the Solara web website itself is written on Solara, and it also has some like larger demos. Here's a, a relatively um, simple but interesting uh, example where you can upload the data sets, make a lesser selection, and then, then download um, download the selections you've done. Um, demonstrate some of the, the uh, very uh, often requested features of uploading, downloading. Um, a project um, started at, uh, at Harvard that was using Qt, and that we're now using Solara for to make this uh, available uh, on the web. Um, a very complex way of interacting with data and multiple data sets. Um, this is an example of where a uh, prototype that was developed in the Jupyter Notebook um, for, um, for planning uh, district heating and cooling is now turned into a uh, full, uh, full product that is um, at the basis of a uh, startup um, we had a Solarathon, a, a, a hackathon uh, that is just finished. Uh, and one of the groups produced a uh, live dashboard. So these are updated like live. Um, and we got really inspired uh, by the uh, Wanderlust demo uh, shown at the um, OpenAI Dev Day. And we made a reproduction of that. So there are actually on the AirMeet in the resources section, <coughs> We have a, a link to that if you want to play with it or see the code. So Solara is open source, <coughs> MIT license. We do regular releases. Uh, we're growing the number of downloads and stars. Um, we have a Discord. There's also a link in the um, uh, in the Air Meet. Uh, otherwise, you can join us here. Um, and we have a uh, we had a community um, a hackathon uh, which we call Solarathon in combination with uh, with uh, Plumer. So we might do this in the future again. So pay attention if you want to learn Solara from us. Um, for adoption, it's also really important that there are some enterprise level support. And just keep this in. I, I, I won't talk more much about this. Um, so yeah, in summary, I think Solara really simplifies building complex dashboards. Um, it's a modern Python web framework, modern in the sense of uh, also, for instance, the typing, hot reloading. Um, it pushes the boundary of the size of apps or dashboards that you uh, that you can build. And I think it's really important to enable domain experts to write actually very large, complex apps uh, uh, purely in Python. Um, we think it's really low risk because we're using 
proofing technologies. Uh, we have an open source community, so there's quite some help you can get, but you can also get professional uh, services. And um, at last, we want to see uh, less of this uh, grumpy cat and hopefully more of this, uh, this happy cat. Um, I'll leave you with the resources. There are also resources in the section here on uh, uh, AirMeet. And if there are questions, feel free to Thank ask. you so much for your yeah, thank you so much for, for your talk. Um, I'm Prashant, I'm, I'm co-hosting this. I have, I, th I can see that there are a um, few questions. Um, I will try and show them on stage. So there are questions, how uh, Solaris compares to um, Streamlit? And then there's another question where it says how Solaris compares to uh, Type I. Um, so that, yeah. that uh, yeah. I can, uh, actually, I think my next slide, yeah, I, I have some comparison of Streamlit uh, directly. I don't know how much time. Uh, let me just go through it. And um, you can read it yourself later on. Also, the slides are there. It, uh, generally, the, the biggest difference is uh, Solaris more towards like large applications, although you can also uh, use it uh, like for smaller um, applications. Lara has more support for Streamlit, like for callbacks. Um, so you can basically have like uh, interactions with figures. Um, and we don't hide CSS. And compared to TypeI, I think TypeI, I don't like writing my UI in a string. Um, what I want is to have a type safety in the whole system. And, and that is something we, we had uh, put a lot of effort in. Uh, any proven system. React is, is now a technology 10 year old. Um, it has proven itself. Um, and I think it's much it, a much safer bet to uh, reuse a technology that's proven for 10 years instead of um, uh, the, uh, coming up with your own DSL in a, um, in a kind of markdown like stream. Thank you. And there is another question. Um... How is it, is it to style dashboards in Solaris? Yeah, good question. So, yeah. Um, so one thing is, is it, um, is it easy? Uh, you can style it using CSS. So that's one thing. So it, it, it is possible. Um, but styling is always, uh, always uh, difficult. Uh, we, we usually uh, work with someone that's more experienced in, in, um, uh, in design, but, but, they, they can fully design, like the Solara Dev website is fully designed by a designer, that, that's possible. I can do it myself a little bit as well. I have basic CSS knowledge and some of the simpler things like uh, colors we expose, um, but otherwise we don't try to wrap another layer around CSS. So if you just ask ChatGPT, like, hey, how do I do this in CSS? It should be relatively easy to, uh, to apply this to Solara. Uh, 